One day ago, we published our video called We Got Our Bailout Money, and it shows us getting that $4,400 from the US government. And I talk about debt and some of the decisions we've made during quarantine. And these videos are always a little bit weird for me to put out there because I never quite know what to expect. But there was a lot of response and I want to go over some of these responses today. A bunch of you guys left really positive comments. Melissa said, I so appreciate what you are saying, trying hard to get out of debt, sing to me, smile for me, said I love everything about this video, sorry to yell. <laughs> When I was laid off because of COVID, the first thing I did was cancel my Amazon Prime and Netflix. Madison says, more of this. This gave me so much perspective. We live for what is the norm for others without realizing we have a choice to live better and not go down with the majority. Please do more of this. These videos are so weird for me because first of all, I love making these videos. Like. For some reason, like finances and money and numbers, it's how my mind naturally works. I enjoy the topic. I don't see it talked about much. So all those things make it feel like it's the perfect conversation and value add for us into the internet. But at the same time, the videos get more dislikes and fewer views than any of our other videos. So I'm always like conflicted, like how do you interpret the views? Does it matter? Do I just make what I like? Or how much do I listen to other people? The next comment is by Nathan who said, while watching this video, I managed to pause and log in to my online banking and do a bit of math. I have the cash to pay off a few small debts that I am waiting to pay off until things settle down with whatever is going on now. But what's the point? I don't need that hanging on my head. While I'm moving nowhere to being close to paying my house off, I know I can sell it and make money and when it's time to walk away, so that's a good feeling too. He says, I think these videos are your best videos. Please do more of them. I agree with most of what Dave Ramsey says, but his stuff comes off too preachy for me. I like your style a lot more. So what I wanna to say to all of these people and all of you that watched the video and logged in and canceled and made changes is one, I love being around people and in conversations with people that are willing to change, period. I don't think you need to change to be more like us, but to see that people are watching a video and then like learning something and then logging in and canceling a membership I'm like, hell yeah, I love that. Because, I mean, that's what I, how I live my life. And these comments like really do matter because first of all, I think we still read all the comments. And second of all, as I'm looking at like the views go down for a video like this, seeing people whose life has actually changed versus maybe more people are entertained by another video, I would rather make videos that help people and change people. So knowing that that change is going on encourages me. So thank you guys for everyone that is joining us and changing their life and sharing about it in the comments section. Chrissy says, after watching this, I canceled my Hulu. It's my least watched service I pay for, so I figured I'd try and see if I miss it. And I just emailed my gym to cancel my membership because I'm doing way better with home workouts than I was trying to drag myself there. Memberships costs are discounted right now, but it still saves me needed money. So thanks for that. I kept my Spotify and HBO though, not giving those up. Man, I, I just love how there's like change happening. Like, okay, so she's keeping some memberships, but she's like at least willing to evaluate and consider uh, everything in her life, which is, I, I think it's just so valuable because sometimes, you know, what these subscription services they want you to do, they want you to make the decision one time and then they make it very difficult to reevaluate. They don't remind you, you know, they don't give you the option easy. Sometimes you have to go through like three or four website pages just to cancel a membership and then talk to a human. So we have to like go out of the way to evaluate this decision because even though we made the decision a year ago, it still impacts us every month. This next comment is from Paulette who says, your story is admirable and being debt-free is important, but too many people are less creative, 
less lucky, less bright compared to you. Poverty is real and I don't think it's because of frivolous purchases. The lack of affordable housing, wages that don't support the minimum expenses. I see what you mean about cable and Netflix, but as a single parent, I struggled to get through nursing school, worked three part-time jobs and had no phone, let alone a cell phone. Had the utilities turned off more than once to the extreme embarrassment of my children, but we survived. Money is not that important to me, but I worked hard, not smart. And my children are responsible functioning adults. They are my blessing. Things are not equitable in our society. It'll be interesting to see how this virus changes the status quo. So there's like a lot I agree with here. And what I admire about Paulette is that although she has a different background than I do, it sounds like she's still willing to listen to my perspective. And I want to be willing to listen to hers because I don't know what it's like to grow up in this world as a single parent. You know, I, I do think we have it so easy, um, than a, so much easier than a lot of people. And I do not think at all that we live in an equitable society. Um, I don't think there's anything equitable about it, really. I mean, maybe it's more equitable than some places, so I guess I might want to take that back a little bit. But I just don't want to compare myself to others and say like, oh, because I did this, you, you should do this, or we do this thing, you should do this exact same thing. But what I do want to encourage people, and I don't think she's disagreeing with this, but I do think that every single person can change for the better, for what's better for them. We can evolve and grow. And I do want to encourage that. And I do also think that it is better to focus on what we can do to make our life better instead of focus on what we can't do. So while our lives all do look very different, and I do agree society is not equitable and people don't have the same advantages that we do, and some people have more advantages than we do, to focus on those things I just have not found to be helpful. Betsy says, my thoughts were the same as Cami. $156 a year, that is a pretty awesome deal for all the Netflix entertainment for a year. I also wanted to know the cost per hour if you watched one hour every day, and it's 43 cents a day. I also laughed out loud when you mentioned getting rid of HBO and Cami was hesitant. Anyways, this is all done and good fun. But one of the things I actually want to mention about the cost of Netflix there's the financial cost, but to me the bigger decision that is much harder to evaluate is actually the cost on your life. Because if I get Netflix, if you're doing it an hour a day, which I would say is pretty minimum, now you have to ask the question, is that really what you want to commit to? Like let's just say we're doing our, um, our plan for 2021 and we're saying, what do we want to get done in 2021? Would we sit here and be like, you know, I want to get 365 hours um, of Netflix watching done. That's what I want for my 2021. Now, I'm not trying to say that TV or entertainment is bad, but sometimes when we make that decision to get the membership, <clears throat> it prompts these other decisions because now I have to feel like I have to use it or I'm wasting money or it just becomes a part of my default scheduling and we just do it and I don't really even like it or want to, but because I made that one-time decision, I'm kind of like locked into this lifestyle. So I agree, it doesn't cost that much financially, but I do want people to think about the big picture effect. Dorothy says, so many people live above their means and in doing that, they struggle day to day. For me, it was just easier to live without a lot of entertainment items and not have all that stress of juggling bills and money. I don't want money to consume me where it's all that I am thinking about. When I wake up, I don't want to be, oh no, the cable bill is late, etc. I'm so much happier for it. I can do whatever I want with my career. I can live wherever I want. I don't have to be scared, especially during these times. I've been like this for years. I am blessed. So this is something that I'm so glad someone wrote because, man, it is really hard to put a price tag on your peace of mind. And I think sometimes we start to accumulate bills that seem normal because people in the culture all have these same bills. Like they have nice cars and we have all these subscriptions and we have nice houses. But what we don't see is how much this raises our stress level. The amount we're working, it seems to be more than ever. 
the amount that we're stressing seems to be more than ever, yet we have like a higher quality of life than anyone in all of history. And that's something that has become so important to me now, just not to worry about stuff. Like if I, if I could live in a cardboard box and not have to worry, I would rather live in a cardboard box than live in a mansion and have a massive amount of stress. So n not that it has to be either or, but I do think that a lot of times we just get used to the stress and we get used to always feeling behind and always feeling like we need to run around. I mean, it's almost like this thing where I notice in America, when I meet people, I'm like, how you doing? They're like, keeping busy. As if that's like virtuous thing that, oh, I'm, my life is so full of commitments because I've bought so many things that I don't have time to rest. And we're like, oh yeah, sweet, good job. Like, like they just bragged about getting straight A's or something. Matt says, essentially you are touching on the minimalism concept. It's the dream, but mortgages take so long to pay off. Um, I'm not intentionally meaning to talk about minimalism, although I think in like a Venn diagram, there's like some overlap. I think what I'm more passionate about, because our life, like we have a lot of shit and I like it, um, but I'm more talking about being intentional. So if you wanna call it something, it'd be like intentionalism, because I'm fine with people having a lot of stuff as long as they want a lot of stuff and they realize what it takes to maintain a lot of stuff. And I do agree, mortgages do take so long to pay off. And that's one of the reasons why I'm a strong advocate against mortgages is because I don't think a lot of people realize um, how much of a commitment, how big the actual cost is. When you wanna buy a house, you see a dream house and you look at one thing usually, it's like the minimum monthly payment and you see something like 500 bucks or a thousand bucks and you think, oh, I can afford that, like big deal, like let's do it. But people don't realize like for an average 30 year mortgage, you know, I mean, think about where you were at 10 years ago. For us, we were in a completely different mindset with so many different values. So in a 30 year mortgage, if I think of how much I've changed in 10 years, that's like almost like three life cycles. So if you think that most people are making one of the largest financial decisions of their entire life, and it has to last through three of their huge emotional life cycle maturity shifts, who's qualified to make that decision? Yet that's the decision we're making when we sign up for a mortgage. We're not just saying I like that now. I mean, people say like, oh, it's weird that you have tattoos because like, I had never thought of something that I would like for the rest of my life. I don't even claim that I'm gonna like them for the rest of my life. I just think they tell a true story. So even if I don't like it, I'm okay with it. But a lot of people, you buy a house and you find out, oh, you're gonna have more kids or it doesn't quite fit your lifestyle. Well, guess what? You're like, you signed up for a 30 year loan on it. And I know people can um, move and they can sell the house and hopefully maybe make some money back. But a lot of times just having debt hang over you for 30 years, it creates a set of mental and practical restrictions that I think limit people's imagination to be able to think of what's possible for themselves and their family. So it takes so long to pay off. And for me, one of the things I value most in my life is like flexibility. And if we see something that we think is a better way to live our life, I don't have to ask a bank for permission to do it. We can just change. X says, she seems so out of sorts. I'm assuming she's talking about Cammy and probably doesn't know how to spell her name or what her name is, so she just wrote she. Tired, stoned, just been talking would be better. Distracting watching her. Get info for the debt-free journey is hard, especially with houses being so high priced. Stacy responds, unfortunately, this is not uncommon. Individually, Cammy is interesting to listen to. Together though, she is overshadowed, can be uncomfortable to watch actually. Man, I am so glad someone said something about this because I have felt the same way. Not just when it comes to financial talks, but actually in our marriage. Cammy's like this a lot, where she just kind of gets like, she looks kind of bored sometimes, and I'm like talking about things that I think are interesting usually money or sex, and I see her over there, she looks like tired. 
She says it's her personality, but I think it's bullshit. So this leaves three main options that I know of. One is if she's gonna be on these videos and if she's gonna look stoned, she might as well just actually be stoned. She could just like smoke ahead of time and we could have it that way and at least be accurate. Um, the second is we could just ask her to fake it and just smile a bunch more and be a lot more cheery. That'd be nice for me because I like it when she smiles and says nice things to me and when it doesn't look like she's like gonna fall asleep. And the third option is just to fire her. So you can see what I end up doing for this video. She's out of here. So if you guys don't see her for a while, anyways, you'll know why. Okay, Mariah says, last year I discovered some subscriptions coming through our bank. I found out I had three subscriptions through Amazon Prime and another through Apple that I wasn't aware of. It added up to $50 a month. I canceled everything and we ended up getting a few yearly subscriptions this year. I think this topic becomes hard because there are a lot of people dealing with significant amounts of debt that cutting, cutting luxury simply won't solve. Medical debt, college debt, mortgage. We have no major debts, didn't go to college and have a much a low mortgage payment purposefully. Um, however, after we had our first child, we had unforeseen medical debt. Okay, this is like a topic I'm like avoiding talking about, but I think it's really important and because it's a Q&A, or I, I'm turning it into a Q&A, I am gonna talk about it. And actually, I fully agree with Mariah in that a lot of monthly reoccurring expenses are important, but they're, they don't come even close to dealing with these mega expenses. And I think there's three big ones that come to my mind in our culture that almost overshadow everything else with a possible runner up fourth. And those three are education, predominantly college costs, medical costs, um, and housing, uh, specifically like mortgages. And I would add like the runner up would be cars. I think a lot of people get like pretty massive car loans. And a lot of times we don't think of these things as a big deal for a number of reasons. One is because they're so normal in our, our culture that you just do it. And two is once again, people evaluate things based upon um, like the monthly payment. And a lot of times when banks that are trying to sell you these things show you the monthly payment, you look at it and you're like, oh, that's not big of a deal. You know, $100 a month or $500 a month or $2,000 a month, not really realizing how long you're gonna be paying it off for. And that when you add a bunch of them together, they end up being a fairly sizable amount. Now, I don't really wanna get into it a whole ton with this video. But I do wanna say that for us, what we have found is that most college expenses are completely optional. Most medical expenses are completely optional. And most housing expenses are completely optional. <clears throat> Not 100%. Everyone's gonna say, well, I'm an exception. Medically, I had to spend this amount of money. And I'm not gonna argue with you, um, you know, you need to do what you need to do. Um, and a few people out there still believe that you need a college education to make money. But this is becoming more and more rare. And all I wanna say is, our experience has taught us that college is not actually about learning and the medical, investing in medical care is not actually about your health most of the time. A lot of these things exist a lot of the time just to give us peace of mind um, and to reinforce the status quo. So I consider our family very healthy. We have spent, um, I, I don't know, I haven't added up. I, I don't wanna say zero because I, I did get a little bit of dental work. We don't have health insurance. You know, I don't know if you guys know that. I, I, we've talked about this in the past. We don't go to doctors. We don't go to hospitals. And I'm not against these things. You know, I think people are gonna go in the comments and be like, oh, well, you're against hospitals. I, I'm not. We just, we practice like a very healthy lifestyle. Right now we're running five times a week. We're doing exercise five times a week. We take our diet seriously because we care about our health. And a lot of people, they don't do those things. I mean, we get eight plus hours of sleep every single night. Um, and a lot of people say that they care about their health. That's why they're spending all of this in medical care. But if you really cared about your health, like really, 
There's other things you can do that are actually free or cheaper that I think are much healthier for you. So the, the only thing I'm trying to say is that if you buy into all three of these areas, the cost financially on your life is incredible. You know, you start off with a college loan that's just massive, and I don't wanna get into the details. Same thing, people, a huge percentage of their income goes towards getting peace of mind for medical insurance. Um, and we've had medical insurance in the past, we just don't have it now. And the same thing with housing. So, you know, I don't know, that's just how we see it. Jennifer asks, can you make a video about your financial career, like what you were doing when you had no money? what you did to make a bunch of money, lost money, et cetera. Or if you already have made one, can someone link it to me? My guess is I have a bunch of these out there. Um, and I'm currently writing a book about this. This will be my third book, I believe. The first one being the Unleashed Your Family that's already released. The Appalachian Trail video book is coming out. And this one about money, I've actually had written for like three years, but I just haven't released it yet and I'm still kind of working on it, but not really aggressively now. But it tells the story of this, but I'm gonna give you the two minute version. Okay, in two minutes, Cammie and I got married when we were 20, and I worked construction for like $12 an hour, and I hated it. And then I went and got a job at working at Red Robin, um, and I got paid like $15 an hour. And this is when we were on like welfare, and I say welfare, but it was called WIC, Women, Infant, Children, because we were living on the poverty line, um, the government would give us like milk and cheese and peanut butter. That was it, we never got cash. Um, now I did that because I only worked 20 hours a week because that was all I cared to. And I don't have a problem with people that qualify for welfare, that get welfare. So some people might say, well, you can, you should have worked harder. Well, I didn't want to work harder. Uh, and when the government said we could take this stuff, so we did. Um, so I only worked 20 hours a week because Cammy was in school for nursing school and I was watching Dove and then it became Eden when they were like, you know, tiny babies. And that was the last job that I had that I was paid for because we quit that to bike across the country. And you know, a lot of people, they say that they can't we can't relate to them or they can't relate to us because we have a lot of money or we think differently. But this decision, and I actually wrote an ebook about this that's available on Amazon. Um, it's called, I'll just put the title here because I don't remember. How, how I went from waiting tables to playing professional blackjack on accident. This decision was one of the most important decisions of our life because even though we didn't have much money, we still prioritized the things that were the most important to us, which was adventure, exploration, and time with family because I quit my job at Red Robin and we started biking across the country um, when Dove was one. And that was actually how we discovered the Appalachian Trail. So then when we got back from that, I learned how to play blackjack professionally, and it was really kind of weird. It was this like uh, accidental thing where I never set out to do it professionally. I was more doing it as like a fun mathematical hobby. And then it turned into this like really 10 to 15 year thing where I played, I ran a team, I started the world's largest website that educated people on how to play, and then I went on to teach people how to play in Las Vegas. And that led to me um, starting an internet startup with three friends um, where we had clients like Google and Facebook and made videos and I became a millionaire and it was like absolutely ridiculous, like more money than I knew what to do with. Um, and then I quit that like probably seven years ago and then retired-ish, I stopped making money. I sold both those businesses, the blackjack one, um, and the internet startup, and we've been living off of those savings ever since because my mindset was instead, I mean, a lot of people think, oh, you're retired, you must have a ton of money. Well, we didn't have a ton of money. We just had enough money to be able to live off of what we thought would be two or three or five years. We didn't know, but we thought, why work now and then have time free after our kids leave? I think it'd be better to spend the best and healthiest years of our life with our kids, and if I ever need to go get a job at Burger King, I knew I could. So, and we've been doing that ever since. We've just been like living off of savings and trying to figure out ways to monetize this vlog, which by making these money videos is a terrible way, evidently. Um, so, you know, that's basically uh, the nutshell version from like our millionaire years where we were making a million dollars a year. We bought property with no debt, like no mortgages, because I had really got, I'd lost tons of money uh, by making bad investments in those time periods. 
And that property helps pay for our life now to a point where I think it might be able to cover most of our bills. Um, but once again, I've already told you guys, like, you know, we don't have health insurance, we don't have life insurance. So we live a very unique lifestyle where, you know, we operate off of our savings and want to build buffers instead of paying companies to do that for us. Um, so I don't consider us rich. I do consider us very free though. But if you want to hear more about that, I'm really writing a book to talk about all the mindset shifts that I went through in that time period because I was really, really against being rich. Like Cammy and I, you know, we didn't register when we got married because we didn't want stuff or gifts and we were planning on moving to Africa to live in the dirt. So we didn't even have a mattress for our first three years. Okay, we're getting near the end. Um, Tree Top Stocks asks, how do you get your spouse on board to plan a budget? This is a really tough one. And what I've learned is a couple things. One is you can't um, force anyone to do anything. No one can get it, you know, I can't force, I can't even force Cammy to get on board with smiling during a fucking video. So how am I gonna get someone on board uh, with forcing somebody to do a budget. Like, it, you just can't. But here's what you can do. One, you can communicate your desires and preferences um, boldly and clearly. So you can say, hey, I think it's really important that we do this. Um, and then I think you can start to take steps to live with integrity into what it is that you value and you believe. Now, here's what people might say. They'll say, well, my, my partner, my spouse, my friend, my family members don't agree with me. They don't wanna do that. They fight me on that. Well, if you're gonna live with integrity, it might mean that you actually have to leave some of these relationships or at least try and separate from some of these people that are stopping you from living a life of integrity. Those are the only two options. You either don't live with integrity and don't live out your values and you live by their values, or you start to say that what you believe is actually important and you're gonna start working towards that. And you invite other people to be a part of that, but don't base doing it contingent upon if other people agree with you. So someone actually left a comment that I'm gonna leave anonymous just because I don't know if, if they mind or what, but it actually tells the story a little bit. And they say, how you strategize is personal. Ben and Cammy, you have grown and moved so far from where you were. The learning through the last few years has blessed you in many ways uh, others would not understand. I became debt free four years ago as I walked away from a marriage that has never really worked. I only took what was mine and I did not want anything from him as I felt he worked to support the family and never drank. Yes, he had his toys, motorbikes, boats, diving gear and bought a small house which is his. I refused to put my name to another mortgage or another loan. I was done. I am the happiest I have been, though I am back at home with my father due to the virus. My next step is finishing my degree and getting a job to save toward my next goal. Great video, guys, really enjoyed it. I love this story because, first of all, this stuff is, is hard to talk about. And second of all, you know, if we don't commit to our integrity and our values and invite other people to do it, what are we doing? You know, are we just here to make other people happy? And I think a lot of people feel trapped in relationships, really frustrated. You know, the, my favorite thing about Cammy, even though I fired her, is that she and I are both willing to change. So although we don't see the world the same way and we don't agree on things, um, we're both willing to hear out and we want what's better than what we just currently have. Okay, this is the last topic and this one is like really important um, and I don't know if I can fit this in this video, but evidently I mentioned something about banana ice cream and how I really want it and all I want is for places to have banana ice cream uh, without chocolate. Is that too much to ask, really? Uh, I don't know, evidently it is, but some people had some opinions on that. Ruth says, OMG, I've been waiting for someone to make banana ice cream without the chocolate too. It's way overdue. Thank you, Ruth. I'm glad I'm not alone in this. Neri Neri says, freeze bananas unpeeled and then just blend them by themselves. Easy banana ice cream and it's vegan. Okay. Um, I mean, I hear you, but that's not ice cream. And that actually sounds like baby food to me. Which, if I'm in a pinch, I appreciate the sentiment. I don't, I'm not there. 
Okay, but we don't have to agree. Uh, Christy says, bluebell banana pudding ice cream. It's amazing. That actually does sound amazing. I don't know about the pudding part. That seems a little weird to me. And I don't even know where you can get that. Also, is Bluebell one of those like cheap $2 for like a bucket brands? Or is this the Texas thing? I don't know. Because I'm kind of, it's one of the things I do splurge on. If I'm like, if I'm gonna eat ice cream, I want it to be real ice cream, not air. Finally, Stephanie says, I don't know if you have it out there, but Cold Stone has plain banana ice cream and then you pick what goes in it. Stephanie, I appreciate your help. My problem with Cold Stone is that it's not dependable. A lot of people have banana ice cream like in July or it's like one of those seasonal things and I want it year round. I just don't feel like that should be too much to ask because it's so good. Like monkeys eat bananas and I want banana ice cream year round with no chocolate. Okay, thanks for everyone that left a comment. Thanks for the conversation. Thanks for people that are willing to change. What did you guys think? What stands out to you about this video? Leave a comment below. Um, buy our stuff. We'll see you guys next time.